scripture for this morning comes from the book of Romans, chapter 8, reading verses 26 to 39. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son in order that He might be firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring charges against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sore? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, be with us this day. May we hear your word, and may we put your word into practice in the living of our lives, now and always. Amen. The concept of today's sermon is simple. We are going to discuss love, specifically God's love for us. The premise is straightforward, but love is not. The word love is used so often in a hundred different ways, it's not always easy to understand. Now in preparation for this sermon, I decided to try an exercise to see what others thought of love. I did the old classic word association game. I contacted three people that I know of different walks of life and asked them to say the first word that popped into their head when I said the word love. I began by calling one of my closest friends. This man has the perfect life. Married to the girl of his dreams, beautiful children, dedicated family man. In a former life, his name was Norman Rockwell. If anyone could tell me about love, it was this individual. So I called him and I said, I'm going to say a word and I want you to say the first word that pops into your head. The word is love. And he said, Well, that didn't give me the answer that I was looking for. So I called another good friend. This person works for emergency services in a downtown city in another state. She is in the business of saving lives and helping people. Now, granted, because of her job, she can be a bit rough around the edges, but basically she is a very decent and loving person. So I called her and I said, I'm going to say a word, and I want you to say the first word that pops into your head. The word is love. And this loving emergency service person immediately said a word that I'm not allowed to repeat. My research was proving quite interesting. So finally I decided to call my older brother. Some of you have met him. He is wise. He is refined, he is an ordained Presbyterian minister, he is a hospital chaplain. Surely if anyone could give me inspiration about love, it is this person. So I called and I said, Mark, I'm going to give you a word, and I want you to say the first word that pops into your head. The word is love, 
and my worldly ordained Presbyterian minister, chaplain brother, said 15. I probably should mention that he was watching the finals of, at Wimbledon at the time, <laughs> and that's kind of what came out. What I confirmed through this exercise is the complexity of the word love. It means different things to different people. It evokes all sorts of emotions and it affects people in different ways. This morning we look at love specifically to learn about God's love and what that love means for our lives. Verse 28 of today's scripture says, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. God's love for us means that God works in all things for our good. Not some things, not most things, but all things. Our lives with God do not consist of isolated incidents, such as running to God when we are sick, or when someone dies, or when we are scared, or when we lose hope. God is involved in every aspect of our lives, working for good. Now that doesn't mean that God only gives us good, or with God all of life becomes good. Notice that in Scripture God is working for good. God is not working to make us happy. God is not working to make us rich. God is not working to take away all of our suffering. God is not working to make life easy. God is working for good. <coughs> That means God is with us during all of life so that every challenge, every failure, every tragedy, every crisis can have in them opportunities for goodness. This is possible because God's love empowers us to focus, not to focus on our selfishness, but to focus on God's purpose for our lives. When we realize that God has a purpose for us, then the way we live begins to change. We see things differently. Our perspective varies. Our direction comes into focus. Our motivations are modified. Our happiness is in God, not on the earthly material treasures. Our security is in heaven, not here on earth. Our purpose is to live for Christ, not for ourselves. All of this is possible because God loves us. Now I love this verse. It, it's, it's one of those scriptures that I can quote and it has provided me with support and confidence for a long time. However, there is a phrase in this verse that has always bothered me. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God. Now does that mean that God only shows that kind of amazing love that God has to those who love God? Is this scripture conditional? Does God not love those who do not love God? Is everyone else excluded, denied, off the team, out of the loop? Well, the very short and quick answer is yes. But it is not God who sets those conditions or limitations. It is us. Barclay says if a person loves and trusts and accepts God, if a person is convinced that God is the all-wise, the all-loving creator, then they humbly accept all that God gives to them. But if a person does not love and trust God, then they will come to resent what happens to them, and ultimately they will fight against who God is. In other words, if a person does not love God, does not believe in God, and excludes God from the way they live, then they are going to reject the offer of love, kindness, trust, and respect that God gives to them. It is the person who gives and loves and trusts and obeys God. They will receive and believe that God is working in all things for the good of God's purpose. Now the second part of scripture today that I want to highlight comes in verses 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. God's love for us is very different than the way we love one another. 
God's love has been described as unconquerable benevolence or invincible goodwill. No matter what we do, no matter how we treat God or hurt God or ignore God, God will never allow any bitterness to come between Him and us. And God always seeks the highest good for us. Now, would your life change for the better if you never allowed any bitterness or any doubt or any moments of worry or hesitation to enter into your relationships? Think of all the relationships that you have made over the course of your life. Uh, the best friend that you met in first grade, your high school and college friend that you still stay in touch with after all these years, your, your parents, your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, your spouse. As intricate, as vast, as complex, as special, as perfect as those relationships were and are to your life, are any of them free from challenge or difficulty? In those relationships to both sides always without fail seek only the highest good and does bitterness never come into play now think of how lucky we all are of how blessed we all are that God loves us that much and loves us with absolutely no strings attached verse 32 of this of today's scripture says he who did not with Hold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Here we see a God whose love has no limits. Now, suppose God's love did have limits. Suppose God's love for us was dependent on our lives and our behavior, was dependent on how much we obeyed or disobeyed God, was dependent on how we sinned or how we remain faithful. How then would verses 38 and 9 of this morning's scripture be changed? Nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. And this love of God in Christ is open to all who are worthy, all who are deserving, who have earned God's favor, God's love is for the faithful, the loyal, those who are never tempted, and those who never stray. We know that God's love is unconquerable, it's benevolent, and it is there for everyone. God's love is for the wealthy and the homeless. It's for the privileged and the poor. It's for the humble and the proud. It's for the faithful and the misguided. It's for the sinner and the congregation. And God's love is for the person that you see in the mirror. As St. Augustine said, God loves each one of us as if there was only one of us to love. After the usual Sunday prayers and right before the sermon, the pastor of the local church told his congregation that he said, I am not going to be preaching today, but instead I'm going to let my friend preach to you. He is a, a minister who is retired. He is older than I. He has been my mentor growing up. He has been like a father to me, and I want you to hear his message today. And so the minister of the church sat down, and this older man got up and started to preach a sermon, a sermon on God's love, how Imagine that, how appropriate for today. And when he got to the end of his sermon, the, the minister said, I, I end today's sermon with a story. Now, I should, I should note there, I don't know if the minister came out from the pulpit to tell a story. I mean, he was a brilliant preacher, he must have. But <laughs> at any rate, he came to tell a story. And he said there was a man who one day went sailing with his son, and his son's best friend. And they were out in the Pacific having a great day of sailing. And without warning and to everyone's dismay, a huge storm surged in the ocean. And the waves and the tumult of the ocean and the current just, just knocked that sailboat all over the place. Man was an excellent sailor, but he could not fight Mother Nature. 
And so pretty soon him and the two boys were thrown from the boat and the boat capsized. The man was lucky enough, he was close and he was able to grab onto a rescue line on the capsized boat. And it took all the strength to hold on to that line. And now the man had a problem. He had one more rescue line and he had two people to save. And so in that split second, he had to make a decision. Do I save my son? Do I save his friend? And a hundred things went through his mind. He knew that his son was a young Christian man who had recently stood up in church in front of everybody and professed his faith in Christ. And he knew that the son's friend was not a Christian. So he thought, if I save my son's friend, my son may be lost, but he will be in heaven with his father enjoying that reward of eternal life. If I save my son, then my son's friend will be lost forever. So in one of those hard decisions that none of us knew what to make, he threw the, he threw the rescue line to the son's friend. He told the son I love them, the waves took him away, and the boy's body was never found. And then in the story, as part of the sermon, the man said, this is what God did for us. God gave up his son to save all. And then in stunned silence, the man, the old minister, sat down. And the sermon ended, church service ended, and the minister and the old guest preacher stood at the door shaking hands at the end of the service. And two teenage boys came up. They were probably the age of the boys in the story. And they came up and one said, that was a nice story, preacher, but it's just a story. This is the real world. No father would ever sacrifice his son to save another. And the old man smiled and he lifted up his Bible and he said, I know of one that would sacrifice his son to save another. And he said, and, and I kind of have a better understanding of what God meant for that. And he looked at the boys and he said, for you see, I'm the father. That is a true story. And I'm the father who gave up his son. And for the first time during the exchange, the minister of the church chimed in and said, and I'm the boy he saved. God loves us and will always seek the best in us. God loves us as if there is only one of us to love. God loves you. There is nothing you can do to make God love you. There is nothing you can do to stop God from loving you. Let us pray. Gracious God, may your love always be with us, by our side, guiding our way, now and forever.